Hi, I'm Patrick Dunnikin. At Gibbons, we believe that citizens need to be informed about the complex issues that affect their lives. That's why we're proud to support the programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by the New Jersey Education Association, New Jersey Council of County Colleges, New Jersey Resources, Create, the law firm of Gibbons PC, the New Jersey Office of the Insurance Fraud Prosecutor. Insurance fraud costs New Jersey families $1,300 a year. And by Fedway Associates. Promotional support provided by bestofnj.com, covering all New Jersey has to offer. And by Jaffe Communications, where business, media, and government converge in New Jersey. Welcome, I'm Steve Adubato. It is our honor and pleasure to welcome back once again. It's been a long time. We have him back, Dr. Shamkant Mulgunkar, and he is the chief of the Renal and Pancreas Division for St. Barnabas Medical Center at RWJ Barnabas Health. Good to see you, Dr. Mulgunkar. Nice to see you, Steve. Yeah, let's talk. Uh, we've had conversations before about kidney disease mm -hmm. and about the kidney transplant process, but I want to put this in perspective. How many people are waiting, if you will, for a kidney transplant in New Jersey and nationally? So nationally, we, co we call it a tragedy because there are over 100,000 people waiting for kidney transplant alone. And approximately 350,000 or more people are already on dialysis. And we estimate close to 500,000 people are probably suffering from chronic kidney disease who will eventually need dialysis or transplant. In New Jersey at this time, approximately 4,000 people are waiting, about 2,500 people are active on the kidney transplant list and uh, desperately looking for kidney transplant. How long do they wait? Uh, average is about three to five years in, in the United States. Some circumstances where the blood type is unusual, like a blood type B, patients wait longer, five to seven years. That's pretty long wait. Um, I, you, uh, to fully disclose, uh, I know this process a little too well, not, not in a bad way, but my wife um, is a kidney donor, and she did it out of your uh, very fine operation, so I know your team quite well. Um, let me ask you this. The surgery itself, mm -hmm. I remember it. I didn't go through it. My wife did, but we talked about it extensively. Describe yes. it. So the, the process of living donation uh, is fairly straightforward for most people. The major thing is you have to come forward to, to donate. You have to be willing to do that. You have to be willing to help others. And then the uh, testing is very complete. Uh, I call it presidential uh, testing. We do everything a U.S. president would go through in order to clear the donor. They have to be willing, they have to be perfectly healthy, and they have to have two normal kidneys to be donors. And the surgical process is very standard since 1998, especially at St. Barnabas Medical Center and Robert Wood Johnson. It is all done laparoscopically using cameras. And we call it minimally invasive because there's not much um, uh, use of knife involved. We use something called harmonic scalpel. So the patients recover much faster. Prior to 1998, uh, Steve, the incision was pretty large. Mm. It was under your rib. It was like a shark bite. We removed the rib. It was terrible for living donors. Recovery was very prolonged. 98 and before? Before 1998. So now patients recover much quicker. They're in the mm. hospital. Most of them go home next day. Some stay a couple of days. Uh, and majority of our donors are able to drive a car by day 7 to 10. Uh, and if you are in a business where you just use a computer or phone, you can return to work fairly quickly within two to three weeks. Dr. Talk about the most important and exciting developments that are going on in your field right now. Well, so uh, currently what we are dealing with is organ shortage. So organ the most shortage. Shortage. So there are not that many deceased donor kidneys that have become available for all these hundreds of thousands of people who are waiting. So we have to be innovative in era of organ shortage so our patients don't die because of lack of kidney transplant. 
When you go on dialysis, your life expectancy shortens significantly as a result of kidney disease and dialysis itself. And dialysis changes your quality of life. So what we are doing is trying to use the number of kidneys that become available to us to benefit more people. For example, in a living donor situation, if I have a, an altruistic donor, a wonderful person who just has no business coming to a hospital and saying, take my kidney, give it to someone. But these are people who are altruistic. They are angels on this planet. So that person's blood type, let's say is O, which is a universal donor, that individual can help another person who may have a living donor that is not compatible. So you give that kidney to the person that she matches or he matches, and that person's donor gives to someone else. So you create a chain, and therefore one altruistic donor can help many, many people. We just did a chain of five because of an altruistic donor a chain last of five? week. Chain of five. Just last week? Last week. Because of one person? One person. So she saved so many lives because it doubles your lifespan transplant. So think about five people getting that many years to live, changing their life. Uh, so that is a big innovation. Uh, the other thing is very interesting. So we are all generous people in this country. Uh, we don't like people suffering. So when you have a person who's compatible to you, let's say I'm compatible to you, but I'm much older than you, uh, and you need a younger kidney. We approach that compatible pair and say, would you like to help other person? Mm. In return, you'll get a younger kidney. So my older kidney goes to a slightly older person, and you get a younger kidney in that process. That is called compatible share. Compatible share. Many people are willing to share their loved one's kidney in return for maybe some advantage. Some people say, don't need an advantage. Give me the same, but as long as I can help more people. And that wasn't happening 20 years ago? No, this is a fairly new uh, approach to living kidney donation to benefit more people who have living donors but are not compatible. But by the way, what's the, name? What's the institute you have? Uh, we have a living donor institute. Interestingly, that was the first living donor institute in the country. And we formed it at St. Barnabas Medical Center several years ago. What it did was it focused all of our energies into learning about how to do different things that would help our patients who would have alternative programs for living donation to help more people. And it has really done a phenomenal job. Just to give you an example, last year we did 301 kidney transplants at St. Barnabas. That's one of the largest kidney transplant program in the U.S. And if you combine the Robert Wood Johnson uh, kidney transplant program that's part of our system, uh, we are capable of doing almost 400 kidney transplants. That's huge for our patients. So uh, the Living Donor Institute has allowed us to look at all these alternative programs, such as altruistic donors, compatible share, a few things I mentioned to you. And it's also allowing us to do a lot of research, innovative things, things that would help our mm -hmm. patients live longer. Uh, it would help them to uh, quickly rehabilitate. Uh, and also, there are many donors who are out of state. So how do you get an out of state donor to complete their testing, come to us, and end up donating and going back home? Finally, you're wearing a uh, pin that is connected to the sharing network. Uh, folks that we do a lot of work with that you know very well, the New Jersey Sharing Network. Um, I don't know if we can put up their, their site, New Jersey Sharing Network. They advocate, they work, they educate folks to mm -hmm. donate. Why should someone donate the organ? Well, uh, philosophically, uh, you can uh, remove uh, other constraints, such as religious constraints sometimes, or your own personal beliefs, and think about someone who is dying because you did not donate your loved one's organs, or if you're a living donor, you didn't go forward, at least with education, to see if you are potential willing donor. So when you t donate an organ uh, or multiple organs from a living donor or a deceased donor, uh, depending on what the situation is, you can save multiple lives. So if your loved one has had a major car accident and had irreversible brain damage, and you have the opportunity to help people, you can help multiple people. Just to give you an example, corneas for two blind people who could see because you gave corneas. Heart transplant. Heart transplant is a magical treatment. Someone who's going to die next day gets a heart transplant can live many, many years. Highly successful procedure. 
liver transplant, two kidneys, two patients can come off dialysis, live normal life. And then a lot of tissues, you know, uh, bones, right, organ skins, incredible. So I think we have to understand that many people have done this. This is not a new, new thing. Uh, our society is the most altruistic society. And the need is great. And uh, the logo, excuse me, the tagline for the sharing network is the gift of life. Correct. And uh, it's well said. Doctor, thank you for everything you do. Thank we you. appreciate it. Thank you very much. Stay with us. We'll be right back right after this. To watch more Caucus New Jersey, find us online and follow us on social media. Steve Adubato here at a very important conference uh, put together by the folks at Virtua dealing with the evolving role of telemedicine. And we're talking with uh, one of the leaders who spoke here at a panel discussion. I was pleased to moderate some fascinating issues that came out looking at public policy. And she is um, Assemblywoman Pam Lampett a Democrat from, um, by the way, I want you to describe your district. So you're standing in my district. So we're in the 6th district, and we represent 16 towns, mostly in Camden County, and one in, uh, one in Burlington County. Assemblywoman, if you could describe, you have several pieces of legislation, and they are intended to improve the way telemedicine, telehealth is dealt with right now. A, why is public policy needed when it comes to telehealth, and I asked the question in the panel, why not just let the marketplace dictate, devil's advocate question, loaded, I know, this whole thing. Why do we need legislation? Well, because right now within our medical community, um, there are so many aspects of, of delivery of quality service. Um, at the end of the day, it is about patient safety. Um, and I believe that uh, needing legislation always to be overarching about the quality of service and patient safety is something that uh, we need to engage ourselves uh, from, a, from a, a policy perspective. So give us an example. We are talking about um, the fact that <laughs> Excuse me, you're talking about parity. Parity in terms of what? So for telehealth, it's all about the patient visit with the physician. Um, and if the patient visit is something where they have an engaging conversation, the doctor is able to uh, get some of your vital signs using tele telemedicine, um, then it's almost like a visit that you had with them in their office. Um, but in other cases, uh, it's it might be two minutes in terms of the process. And so uh, they would consider that a doctor's visit and is at the same sort of level of reimbursement. Um, and that's what we're talking about. So someone, let me ask you this. The whole question of parity, say someone said, hold on, are we saying that insurance companies should reimburse a physician or a clinical professional the same amount for a face-to-face -face visit as the insurance company should reimburse for a telehealth visit because the quality is the same? In many cases it is. So yes, in many cases it should be. Uh, what we didn't speak about today, which I think is the overarching, is mental health. Uh, when we look at the mental health crisis here and way, with the way our behavioral health services um, and access to good therapists, um, their engaging services could be 45 minutes to an hour, just as a visit uh, within, the, within the presence of a, of a roof under them. Um, so in that case, it should be at parity. Um, and that's what we're talking about. But the, as, I, as I explained during the session, um, there's a vast number of, of aspects that can get involved in here. Uh, a minute clinic is not the same sort of thing. And unless we make it very, very clear about the reimbursements, we could have minute clinics where they don't really physically see a patient, that it's all being done through telehealth. And the parity uh, for reimbursement just should be very different. So let's talk about this. What are you sensing that most consumers are looking for when it comes to telehealth? I mean, people often say, I just want to get FaceTime with my physician. But are you sensing more and more that patients are looking for that conversation, that email, that text message, that some communication that's not face-to-face? -face. Well, I think it's all spectrums of communication. And this is where, we, again, we have to define what the word communication is. Um, and, and in every single case, we need to ensure the fact that the interaction that happens between the physician and the patient is actually something that is recorded. Uh, we what do you mean recorded? Make that clear. 
you know, part of it has to do with uh, store forward information to make sure that, uh, that eventually this information, if it's audio, uh, gets put into the electronic medical records. We need to make sure that, uh, and now we need to redefine what is that. It's not just uh, a dictation of information. It could be an audio that's stored. It could be a video that's stored. And we need to ensure the fact that all of that is spelled out into this legislation so to ensure the fact that reimbursement happens. So when you're talking to your colleagues, um, I'm curious about this because you clearly understand these issues. You clearly are committed. You've researched them together with your staff and others. You, you said when we were doing the panel today that you're a bit like a sponge, I think that was the analogy you used. You're a really good listener and you're listening to all different perspectives. To what degree do you find that your colleagues, both sides of the aisle, Democrats and Republicans, 120 members of the legislature, <clears throat> To what degree do you sense that they're truly wanting to understand the complex, often gray nature of these issues of telemedicine and telehealth? So, uh, you know, I approach it very differently. And I want to ensure the fact that a piece of legislation that I've worked on for a year or two is something whereby it can be supported both by Republicans and Democrats in a unanimous sort of style. It's my responsibility to empower myself to communicate to them you know, what's the essential components of a piece of legislation so they feel comfortable with voting for it. I don't leave it to them, to, for them to uh, be the inertia behind it. I have to be that person that goes to them to ensure the fact that they have all the information needed so that they can make with good sound judgment uh, and push the right button. Telemedicine, telehealth, next five years, you see what? Well, I just spoke to a gentleman that talked about uh, getting a patent for avatars. Um, so when you look at that, uh, to be able to build a Steve Adubato avatar would be able to talk You're about scaring it. our audience right now. I know, I know. It's all good. It's all good. But uh, to build the Steve Adubato avatar would be able to take all of your ailments, all of your issues, all of your background in terms of your family-related issues, as you shared today, um, and put that into what would be an avatar. And then for the physician to be actually to be able to, uh, you know, prescribe something and to see what the long-term effects would be. Uh, that's how the future is going to uh, hold for us. We're not talking about it now. We can't put that into this piece of legislation because if we were waiting every single time somebody came up with a new technology advancement within the medical community, we would never get this piece of legislation signed into law. As I stated, this is organic. This is something that I'm very committed to, uh, not just today, but the future and where do we need to go. Thank you so much, Assemblywoman. Thank you very much, too. I appreciate it. To see more Caucus New Jersey with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Dr. Jeffrey Lee is uh, Vice President for Academic Affairs and Chief Academic Officer at Essex County College. Good to see you, Doctor. Good to be here. Doctor, you are part of the uh, series uh, Classroom Close-Up that our colleagues and friends at the New Jersey Education Association, um, they featured you, we're about to see a video, mm -hmm. that features you and, and your work with a Sophia Medina, who is a student from Ecuador, correct? Correct. And, and why is this significant, we're about to see? She is one of our students who has come from so far back. She came to this country looking for education with her family and has the ability and had the stamina to succeed in classroom but just didn't have the academic ability and the immigration status issues and so she came to us and we were able to help her to the point where now she is finishing up school at Johns Hopkins University and debating on whether to go to med school or for a master's in public health or to do all of the above. That's awesome. By the way, your area of expertise is? Microbiology. Oh, that thing. Yes, that thing. Pretty awesome. <laughs> Microbiology. This is a piece from a Classroom Close-Up, which you can catch on a regular basis on the great uh, NJTV, the public television station in the great state of New Jersey. Um, this is the video piece that features Dr. Lee and Sophia Medina. Check it out, classroom close up. Hey. Hi, Dr. Lee. Favorite student? Sophia Medina is a graduate of Essex County College. 
she comes back often to visit with some of her former professors, especially Dr. Lee. Out of probably 2,400 students over 22 years, she is one of the top five that I have seen academically. Um, it was very nice. But her academic success has not come easily. Throughout most of her life, Sophia has faced many uncertainties because of her undocumented resident status. The main reason why my parents decided to move uh, our family from Ecuador to the U.S. was mainly for educational purposes. During my senior year, when I was applying to several schools, I got accepted to one of my top choice universities at the time, which was Penn State University. And seeing that there was just no way for me to pursue those opportunities for economic reasons and also my immigration status uh, was very um, disheartening. It was like, I'm going to Essex County College and I'm going to be there until I get my residency. If I'm there for a semester and I get my permanent residence, then I'm transferring after a semester. In a way, it was sort of an arrogant behavior. Um, and I recognize it. and. Very quickly, when I came here, I was humbled. I met very uh, empathetic professors um, and people who not only helped me to grow academically, but helped me to grow as like a human being. Um, so I ended up staying here for three years, so longer than what I initially expected. But when I got here, I wasn't in a rush to like get out anymore. 2014 was a great year for Sophia and her family. She graduated with a 3.96 GPA and is currently enrolled at Johns Hopkins University in the pre-med program. The Medinas also received their permanent resident status. Dr. Lee has been one of the people I treasure most at Essex County College. So to have someone who was like so on board with me and to be like, yeah, absolutely, like I'll help you is really great. And that motivates me because I, I don't think I have any reason not to succeed. She's one of the students who you really know has the abilities and you know can do well. They're the ones who you know you'll see in the newspaper or you'll see running research labs. To know now that when I see that down the road that I had some hand in getting her there makes me happy. How could you be uh, any more proud? Like she was my daughter. I mean, uh, uh, what did you see in her when you first met her? She was a student who went beyond the classroom. So in the classroom, we have certain things we work on, things students are expected to do. She was always going beyond that. She always had dreams beyond that. She could mm. see things beyond the classroom that I just found astounding. So you know, Sophia, one of the millions, if you will, coming to this country, immigrants, undocumented, do we have any idea what they face? They face a lot. They face scorn in some cases. They face ridicule in schools, in public schools in New Jersey where they do get a very good education they're often disheartened because they don't have the ability to, which you heard, apply to different schools because of their status. Many times young students and young people like Sophia, they're supporting their families, their parents, their grandparents. They're the ones who know the language, so they're the ones that have to act as the mediators for court cases and other things. And so particularly for the young students and the young people coming into the country, they have a very, very hard, very heavy burden on them to support themselves and their families. What kind of contribution could Sophia potentially make to this country, to this community? Sophia, community? Sophia, like a lot of our students that come through biology, the ones that I've seen, they don't so much want to be doctors to go out and have a practice and specialize. It always comes back to, I want to help people. So it's never, I want to have a practice this, this community needs help, or this country doesn't know basic medicine or basic health care. So most of them are looking at medical degrees, but then looking at a much broader expanse of helping other people. They all seem to have that same, I want to help the world mindset. Why do you teach? 
I love it. It's something I didn't plan on doing 40 odd years ago, but Essex is a unique place. It's a place where my colleagues and I come to work from very different backgrounds, like our students, and we stay there like an extended family. We don't always get along, but we all believe in the school and we all believe in our students, and that's what keeps us coming back. A few seconds left. I'm a student of leadership. So are you. What's the greatest lesson you've learned about leadership? Greatest lesson in leadership is? <sighs> greatest lesson I've learned in leadership probably would be my father, who's now passed, who has taught me to not belittle people and do what you can with what you're given. Hmm. You clearly have. Thank you. And uh, Sophia Medina, um, one of your students, is going to great things. She's at Johns Hopkins right now. Correct. Dr. Jeffrey Lee, uh, Vice President for Academic Affairs and Chief Academic Officer at Essex County College, part of the uh, Classroom Close-Up series uh, that we featured together with the NJEA. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. The preceding program has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence and 13 for WNET, NJTV, and WHYY. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by the New Jersey Education Association, New Jersey Council of County Colleges, New Jersey Resources, Create, the law firm of Gibbons PC, the New Jersey Office of the Insurance Fraud Prosecutor, and by Fedway Associates. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Caucus New Jersey has been produced in partnership with TriStar Studios. Think this is absurd? Insurance fraud costs every New Jersey family over $1,300 every year. Report fraud at njinsurancefraud.org.